Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to TechPoint. Today our guest is Chris, the CEO of Blackthorn. Hello. How you doing? Doing great. Please tell us what your company does. We make apps for the salesforce.com platform. So if you run events like uh, Eventbrite or Cvent kind of thing and you use Salesforce, you can use our app instead. And if you want to do payments, you can use our application too. Is it only for Salesforce? Yes. Okay. And what are your products? Can you walk us through them? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a few different apps. They're mostly geared towards higher ed and nonprofits. Uh, so if you run events or do payments or want to send a SMS uh, text message, or if you want to do more with compliance um, with PCI and masking credit card information. And we also have another one coming, which we call the storefront. So if you want to sell continuing or executive education as a higher ed, then that's something you can do. We separately have almost like two businesses in one where we have a mobile payments application as well. So if you want to uh, take a payment when you're in the field, if you're doing like field service type of work, then you can do that. But it's more of like enterprise uh, B2B type of payments, uh, type of business, I mean, yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. And what do you say is the biggest problem that you solve? Um, for businesses, one of the biggest problems is that their data is in multiple places, so they can't make a single picture of a of a customer, of a person. I mean, that's what Salesforce is like solving in the first place. But when yeah. you add all these other systems, your information is like, you, you can't really report on it. Like if, if you uh, paid for a service with an organization and you went to one of their events and you bought a course that would typically live in three systems that are all not part of your CRM. So then the company has like four records of you and they can't really make sense of it. So we're solving for that at the foundation. I understand. I understand. Thank you for explaining. What are our top three features? Well, that's a good question. You'd think I know the answer to that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <No pressure. laughs> yeah. let's see, uh, I guess in our events app, something people really like is how you can do translation. Uh, we can translate events into any language with like a static translation mm -hmm. with payments. Um, you can type in card numbers and use a physical card reader. I mean, it's a very common feature that a lot of applications have, but it's very uncommon for anyone that's running Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, a third feature, I really like our mobile check-in application for organizers. So you can like swipe people into your event when they come. So. Okay. And what is the pricing for uh, Blackstone? It really ranges. Uh, they, they more or less start around 10,000 a year for organizations and then they go up from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, can you show us some of your integrations? Well, I think we integrate with like 30 systems at this point because everyone has different stuff that they're running like payments for example we have stripe and authorized.net there's spreedly touchnet cashnet uh and then within stripe they have like seven different apis that we're integrating to for our events app that thing is working with i mean we we query the data through aws it's also working with cloudinary for our cdn with cloudflare for ddos as well as like uh global load balancing and then we have a lot of the webinar integrations, like go to meeting, go to webinar, Zoom, WebEx. I don't know if anyone even really uses WebEx anymore, but some people, <laughs> we could get requests for it. Yeah. Um, there's like email integration. So we, we send emails with SendGrid for SMS. We use Twilio. Uh, we're working on a WhatsApp one. There's, there's yeah. just tons of them. They're kind of important for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and were you the first one to, to solve this problem or do you have any competitors? Yeah, we, um, we do have competitors, but, uh, what was unique about us is that we were the first organization that really focused on delivering, uh, events for Salesforce. So there were a few other companies, um, doing it, but they often did it ancillary. Like they had a core business doing something else and they never really focused mm -hmm. on this. So they. They didn't put as many devs behind it. They didn't have the same um, uh, feature velocity. So um, now our main competitor is mostly just Cvent, I guess. Uh, but they've been building theirs for like 20 years. So, <laughs> but their architecture is different. Like 
they they don't use Salesforce as a system of record. They have an integration application. So there, there's a lot of foundational differences to users and how they interact with the applications. Yeah, that's why I asked <laughs> to further clarify it. Uh, and when did you start the company? 2015. So seven years now. It'll be eight years in August. <laughs> and how did you come up with the idea? Uh, I was running a Salesforce implementation company at the time to do... Uh, well, we just implement Salesforce for people. But then I, <laughs> I used a lot of the existing payments apps and none of them integrated with Stripe and they needed a lot of custom dev work in order just to be able to function. And that's like not what an app is supposed to do. Yeah. So we made this payments app and then my co-founder at the time, he's no longer with the business, but he had the idea to uh, do the same thing for events. So there were other events apps at the time but they were quite a bit harder to use and they didn't have a number of features that we wanted. So our stack is a bit unique because our events app uh, actually uses our payments app for the checkout. So when you go to do a payment, our customers actually have both installed. So it mm -hmm. looks like we're running like two different things at once, but it's actually part of the stack. And how big is your team right now? We have 106 people across 15 uh, countries and 23 US states. We were, we were remote from the beginning. We didn't like change anything from COVID. That's awesome. That's awesome. And have you raised any funds? Any, any what? Sorry. Any funds. Have you raised any funds? Oh, sorry. Um, sort of. So uh, the first few years, no. In 2018, we almost went bankrupt and my aunt uh, put in some money. Uh, my friend threw in like 50K and... Uh, the launch accelerator that Jason Calacanis fund put in like a hundred K and then that was, that was like it. And then the next year, uh, employees wanted more ownership than just stock options. And they like, they insisted on buying shares. I said, okay. So then they bought like 180 K and that was all that we really raised for a while, which is like, you know, to pay for salaries, that's like nothing. Usually rounds of the size are minimally a few million to get started because the payroll is just a lot. But, uh, Last year we did a big, was it last year? I think I'm getting my days confused. Maybe it's the end of the previous year. Anyway, yeah. we did a big yeah. debt facility. Mm -hmm. So we now have a 18 million uh, debt facility where um, there's like a four year interest only period. And then there's a balloon um, payment structure at the end. So uh, that's been going quite well. It's allowed us to grow quickly. Um, our partners in the deal are, uh, Level Equity and RF Partners, and they've been great to work with, and uh, it's working well. And we're a bit unique also because we don't have a board. So usually yeah. by this size of a, of a SaaS company, you have a board, and um, it's allowed some nice uh, flexibility. Like we do a four-day work week, and I don't know what a board ever would have thought about that. And <laughs> there's no one like pressuring us that we have to do anything in particular. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think are the most... Uh, the advantages for choosing a debt rather than uh, raising funds from VCs and uh, why did you make yeah. the, the choice? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's a luxury that you don't have when you're starting. Like no one's going to give you debt on no revenue. Like it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah. We we only did it once we, we... We actually went with CapChase, which is uh, like revenue-based financing. Yeah, um, I know that. Before we went to... Uh, a structured facility and they helped us. I, I bought two companies in 2021. I don't know. I, I'm getting 2021, 2022 too confused, but uh, they helped us buy a company and then they helped us scale a whole bit before then. But then we wanted to do something like much bigger. Their, mm. their uh, creditors have specific limits on the amount of risk um, and to do something that's like a lot more leveraged to go yeah. like one-to-one -one of debt and ARR. All the revenue-based financing ones, they'll go up to like maybe half, like 50%. But if you want to do one-to-one, -one, you have to go like outside of the revenue-based financing stuff to do traditional diligence and whatnot. We didn't do that uh, with, with this bigger one until we were around uh, like 8 million ARR. We're at like uh, 13 now. And we're looking to be uh, break even by the end of the year, which should be around like 20, something like this. And then at that point, we'll, we'll probably go for... Um, a senior uh, debt facility. Like th these are the, the banks that uh, they're like the lesser known banks. It's not like JP Morgan bank of America. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um, customers bank is the one that we'll, we'll likely end up working with. 
but but to answer this, why we went this way. So uh, in 2018, I pitched 100 investors in person as part of the uh, launch accelerator. And I got 100 no's, like zero people wanted to invest at all. So oh. it's not that I didn't want to do VC. I yeah. just didn't have a choice. And so we had to scramble then for a few years and keep costs tight and launch stuff and get lucky a few times and get some prepayments. <laughs> and uh, yeah. then eventually I had something like 52 investors reach out that all wanted to invest. I didn't approach any of them. <laughs> and I said, okay, sure, you can invest, but we've made it this far. I don't want to have to put a board in place to be able to, to do it. Do you want to do it? And only one group uh, was open to it after like talking to all these people and uh, the valuation they wanted was like not great. But the problem with it is that they, they, a lot of these groups have to have their checks be a lot bigger. So they'll have minimum check sizes of like 15 million. And yeah. the problem with writing a 15 million check at a lower valuation is that we didn't need $15 million. And because of that, we would have had to have um, diluted at that valuation that I didn't want to do. So if they had said, hey, we'll do 5 million at this valuation, I say, okay, great. You know, let's do it. Um, and these numbers, they all sound kind of big, but like our payroll is $10 million a year, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if, if you think about the scaling, if we're at 13 million a year with like 10 million payroll, which will grow another, I don't know, one or 2 million or something this year from, from hiring, um, you really need like pretty significant money if you want to be able to, to hire ahead of revenue. So because they didn't give us a great valuation, I said, okay, what other options are there? So we looked into this, these bigger, uh, debt facility providers and, um, Mike Bauer over at, he was at level equity at the time. He, uh, got pretty creative with what they were able to offer us. And they were able to do more debt than other providers were willing to do, uh, I don't know why, but they did a, a mix of uh, equity and debt. So they did a little yeah. bit of equity where we did some stock buybacks. Um, we gave some earlier investors like launch and my aunt and my friend, we gave, we did some buybacks and um, uh, a, a small bit of, of liquidity for, for me as well, which helps. Like if you're a founder, been doing something for a long time, like Absolutely. it helps to like <laughs> take, take the, take chips off the table as they say. Get a little yeah. in the back account. Um, but but the, the benefit was that all, all I've heard, I, I'm in a founders group in New York City with 250 founders and uh, all of them, uh, in addition to every founder I've ever talked to with the exception of one, has said that uh, they can't stand their boards because they, they're described as like uh, vultures who always want more. Now, granted, I've read some amazing things about some great boards. There's some yep. great advisors out there, people that have done this before, particularly when you get founders onto boards, like they have a, a different type of mindset. They're not pushing you for growth at all costs. They're not saying like, oh, you have to fire all these people in order to do something else. And I just, I started the company, one of the reasons is because I didn't want a boss. And if I had to put a boss in just to get the, the funding that we wanted, like it, it didn't make sense. So. You know, that those are the reasons that I did it for. It becomes kind of personal. Like if if we were in like a very, very competitive scenario and our main competitors raised like a hundred million dollars and the the only way we could do it would be to just go after the same thing, I don't know if we would have had choice. Uh but yeah. you know, it's kind of like a slower moving arena. Not everyone's focused just on Salesforce. Like it's not like the most popular sexy concept. So <laughs> that's that's the route we went. That's that's awesome. That's uh, such a great value. Well, <laughs> I'm impressed. I, I, I asked this uh, this before. Uh, um, I asked this be, because uh, it's a lot of debate on that topic: uh, raising funds mm -hmm. from VCs versus uh, debt. And, yes, well, it's it. The problem with debt too is yeah. If if you if you can't get your revenue up, what happens at the end when the money is due? And there's this con concept of uh, venture debt, where um, there's a lot of uh, very unfriendly clauses that come into play where the, where the debtors can end up forcing a sale of your business. If things like don't, 
go the way you want them to. And a lot of times you actually can't get venture debt unless you have VCs on the board. So a group like uh, Silicon Valley Bank, like one of the most most famous banks that do venture lending, they're just like, no, we're not going to give you any money because you don't have any uh, VCs on the on the board, which is fine. That's the position of a lot of these groups. Yeah. But but there's like horror stories about venture lending. Like I saw um, Paul Graham did a tweet about how he always advises people not to do uh, venture lending. And I, I frankly, I'm not sure on all the reasons, but I know one that could be very scary is if you don't get your revenue up and for some reason it goes down, like you can get pretty stuck. So, you know, for us, it was, uh, it was very minimal dilution compared to what a, a round would have been, you know, a traditional rounds like 15 to 20 and sometimes 25% and they get sometimes like two or three liquidation preference, like things that are like not enjoyable. So, yeah. You know, that, that's why we ended up going the debt route. Thank you so much for explaining. What yeah. has been your biggest challenge since founding the company? There's no biggest challenge because it changes like every six months. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so early on, it was a revenue and technology problem. We had to accelerate features while not going bankrupt. Now we don't have either of those problems. Uh, now it's people problems. So once you get like, enough people you end up getting lots of personalities because yeah. as a startup you like when you have 10 people it's people that are a little bit nuts they <laughs> they don't require all this process um they're okay with working really long hours but they get the benefit of having a lot more stock options so like all of our early employees that had a lot more options they ha have a lot more options they're most of them are still still with us which is great and um uh, they, I don't know, maybe are a bit more, more flexible and I don't know, but as we get bigger with more types of personalities, a, a person that joins a later stage company now, granted, we're still a hundred people. We're not like 50,000 or something, but if you join like a later stage company, you have a different personality than if you join like someone that a company that's brand new and you have different types of, um, almost like standards of professionalism that you have to follow. Yeah. Otherwise you end up with, I don't know, for, for the sake of not being called out for saying something I, I shouldn't say, I'll just say that uh, you end up having to be more careful with your words. Um, but it's not just me. It's like all the employees. If, if one of them says or does something that like doesn't go so well with what you're supposed to say, it's an issue. So now there's, there's a much bigger focus on the, the hiring and, and people side than early on. It was just about like making sure the company doesn't die. Um, mm -hmm. So th those two things have been big ones. Another one is um, as a person, if you do the same thing for seven, eight years, like you, you got to have some variability in there. Otherwise it's like, you know, I'm, I'm like just doing the same thing constantly. So for me, I, I've changed up my role a number of times. And the thing I enjoy the most is doing the product and engineering work. And mm -hmm. for a time, I like stepped back from it and was doing other stuff. and didn't know I had this like existential, what am I going to do thing? <laughs> but now I've pushed myself back into it. And that's, that's been a lot more enjoyable. So, I mean, there, there's been uh, all, all manner of challenges throughout this thing. I, I guess another one has been um, this this. Uh, sort of self-imposed push that if I personally don't change, I won't change with the company. So mm -hmm. instead of having these long slack rants, I then have to shut up and then just rant to like one or two people on the company that I can run <laughs> ideas by instead of like yeah. dumping all this in the main channel because no one <laughs> wants to hear it. And they'll think I'm nuts and like it, it's, it's too shaky for people. And um, uh, I, again, as I said, I, I, I don't want to boss uh, whenever I go to sell this thing, like, you know, it, they can get another CEO in here to, to run this thing. I don't, I don't want to report to someone, you know, I'll do a transition period and get this off. So I, I, I had, I've been forced to change to make sure I like stay in that, uh, that zone, but other people now handle all the things I'm, I'm, they're much better at all the things I hired them for, like sales and marketing and, and engineering, all these things are much, much better at these things than I am. That's understandable. Yeah. What do you think was uh, your best growth tactic throughout the years? Uh, well, the the bulk of our leads come from partners. Salesforce is unique because uh, as an organization, you you work with these implementation partners to help you uh, get up to speed. 
because it's 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 not that Salesforce is uniquely hard to use. It's if if you have to structure integrations using code or middleware, or if you have to build custom automations using code. Like not every organization has that in-house person or people to do that. So yeah. these partners will go into uh, these companies, and the company will say, "I want to do events," or the partner will say, "Hey, you should do events because I see you're using." Cvent or Eventbrite or something. And here's like the benefits you can have. So these partners bring us into their deals. So we keep, we, we give the partners all the attention we can possibly give them. We help them with joint marketing. We do architecture support. We'll hop on calls at any time to help them with stuff. We'll help them figure out pricing. We get a lot of requests for proposals, the RFPs, and we work very closely with them to help them figure this out. So early on, the, the main strategy was uh, just to get really close with partners. And then we did this like, th there's a well-known strategy where you generate a lot of landing pages and you see which landing pages stick for what kind of messaging. And okay. we sort of did that with the app exchange because it was kind of early at the time when you could sort of do what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So we put like six or seven apps up there, but they really didn't do very much. And we wanted to see what kind of leads came in. Mm -hmm. um, that, that helped to determine interest in the apps, but it also helped to determine the verticals that made sense. So we started to see um, uh, higher ed and uh, nonprofit come to us for our events app with a sprinkle of uh, healthcare. So yeah. then we just spun that around and went after them. And for payments, we started to get more of this like niche type stuff that we then spun around and went after them. So it's not like we had this initial thesis of what vertical or go to market needed to look like. We just knew that the technology for these two areas sucked and it had to yeah. be better, but we didn't know who to sell it to. <laughs> yeah. So those things helped. So we, we put up like all these landing pages, which we eventually killed five of the apps. Like we, we really <laughs> killed a lot. We like merged them into yeah. other stuff. And then we went after the verticals that were inquiring in the first place. Yeah, that's, that's smart. And what, what's the f future vision with the uh, black thought? Uh, Two things. So we have a lot of stuff that we're launching around April that we've built for, built, been building for about a year and a half. Like we rebuilt an event wizard in the application. We have our storefront app coming out. We have a virtual events app coming out. Granted, it's like three years late and all the other companies did it really fast. But uh, we have that thing coming out. And then we're going to layer our mobile attendee app coming out. So there's a lot that's coming for the events arena as well as storefront. But then the, the next wave on top of that is a way to bring it all together. So mm -hmm. as an organization, you then have every single one of our apps. How do they all function in this like unified manner? And I have no desire to uh, take this company public and like ring the bell and stuff. So at mm -hmm. some point in a, in a few years, we'll likely go to run a process to sell unless someone randomly comes in with some wild, crazy thing before then. But there's a lot more... Uh, product that I want us to launch that we've been working on. And we're just starting to really hit this inflection point where much larger organizations are now inquiring with us to get going. So it's like, I don't know, this is like a eight year overnight success, I guess. Now <laughs> this is finally like, like uh, working better. Yeah. So I, I know that's not a very clear answer, but I'm excited about all the stuff to come. And I know that I don't want to ring the bell someday. So we'll sell at some point in a few years or something. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. And I love to hear your backstory even before Black Thought. So how you started your career? Sure. Um, so I, I, ha I have parents who were uh, not the most loving. Uh, my, my dad uh, hit me quite a lot. Uh, my mom uh, used to do the same, used to chase me around the table with like a paddle and go to hit me. And, and I, I didn't like being around them. Yeah. Um, this led to a lot of depression. I have, uh, oh, I, when I was around 20, I found out I have, um, bipolar two, and I always, I was like depressed like as a kid, but no one ever like slapped a label on it. And I've been on medication since, but, but the, the reason I'm giving you this backstory is because these things combined to push me to, uh, be alone, to be by myself. And, uh, if you're by yourself all the time, a computer is a pretty nice outlet. So uh, I was fortunate enough to have a computer at a pretty early age. I think we first got a computer when I was like nine years old. I'm 41 now, whatever math that is. And I, I really like doing stuff with operating systems and um, learning stuff about code. I'm a terrible developer. I never ended up being a developer. Um, 
-hmm. I can read through sequences. I took computer science. Like I used to write Perl and CGI scripts, but I, I just yeah. spent a lot of time on a computer by myself. So I did some work for a friend in high school, um, writing these scripts. Uh, actually, when I was in middle school, there was this local internet service provider, like, you know, they, when you do like dial up modems, they used to pick me up and pick me up from like middle school, high school to then go build their uh, customers websites. So I was doing that for a while. And then I took a hiatus for like a decade during college and did property management for real estate and stuff and got back into all this computer stuff in 2011 with the Salesforce ecosystem working for a friend. And um, you know, then it's, I don't know, took, took off from there. I really enjoyed Salesforce because you could be rather technical without having to be a developer. It was a bit mm -hmm. unique in that sense. Uh, I, I always enjoyed the architecture piece. Yeah. So yeah. then I worked at a company for, I worked at his company for two years, helped him grow it and got all semblance of understanding the business. I was very into the Salesforce admin pieces. And uh, I, I was also into like the sales piece and doing all this. Then I worked for another company for a year and a half. Uh, they eventually fired me. Long story. I'm now I'm friendly with the owners and whatnot. And they later apologized for how it happened, but you know, <laughs> things happen, whatever. And yeah. then I started my implementation company, uh, ran that for a year and a half with another guy and then started this. Great. Great. Um, and, um, what's your best piece of advice for founders? Uh, you've been in the space a lot and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my advice is, um, it's very easy to end something. It's very easy to quit. If it's a, a business or a relationship or a hobby, you can wake up the next day and that's it. Um, so, so if things get really tough, because at some point they always will get really tough. Uh, if you want to quit, you can just literally quit that minute. Um, but if you don't quit, it doesn't mean that it's going to work. Uh, it just means it has the best chance of working that it could possibly have if you didn't quit. And it's very easy to want to quit. Uh, there were many, many, many times I wanted to quit. I couldn't sleep, I was crying, was suicidal thoughts, like horrible. Um, but uh, uh, th that's my advice. If you're thinking about quitting, uh, just know that it's very easy to quit. And uh, there's, there's a lot of things you can do uh, before then without having to go that route. doesn't mean it's going to work, but this is the best chance it has. Yeah. I think the transparency helps a lot. So thank you for sharing this. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I have uh, just one last question. So let's uh, let's end it on a happy tone. What's your favorite software apart from uh, Blackthorn and the Salesforce? Because you already, yeah. <laughs> favorite the software, software that you that you use daily and uh, you'd recommend to to others. Uh, let's see. It, it's not it's not exactly new anymore, but. Um, I love Superhuman, the Raul Vora software. Uh, when the, I started using the thing when it came out pretty early, because uh, Jason Calcanas helped Raul. Um, he helped uh, fund his first app, the LinkedIn Reportive. Now LinkedIn, but it was called Reportive. And then he helped him fund this. They were two years um, without launching, and then they eventually launched it. And it was just so much faster than Gmail. And... Um, you know, I, a lot of people, I, I got a lot of people in our team using this thing. I think we have like 15 or 20 of us using this thing and it's just, it's way better. Super. Is there anything else that you want to tell us today on the podcast? Uh, it's, it's, um, running a company is not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but if you started a company, that means you clearly have wanted to do it. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's doing this. My email is chris at blackthorn.io, uh, or you can add me on LinkedIn or something. Um, but uh, it's rewarding. It's really hard, but it's just, it's rewarding. I'm really grateful for for you being here and sharing this uh, this value. So thank you so much. I'm really grateful. Cool. Thanks, Christian. <laughs>